Hello, everyone. This is Eddie, and this is Catholic Recon, testimonies from reverts and converts. And today I've got guest Josh Schultz, who I met about, uh, I think, a little over a month ago, mm -hmm. at a little get together. And he shared his testimony. It was brief. We didn't have a chance to really connect. But when I had the idea for this, this little YouTube thing, I said, you know what? I want to hear the extended version. So welcome, Josh. Yeah, thanks, Eddie. Appreciate um, you having me. And like I had mentioned to you before, uh, you know, we, there's some online venues that I think were really helpful to me um, in, in my own journey um, called communion.com, you know, with Brian Cross. So I think what you're doing is great. So thank you. Appreciate that. So why don't we start with kind of what I did the last few weeks, just break down the entire thing and then at the end, you know, if I have questions, anything comes to your mind in addition, then we can talk about it at that point. Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, as I was trying to put this together, I think that I, I was wrestling with whether or not to really focus on what it was like coming out of the evangelical background that I, I started in, you know, or, or when I was in the last 10 years, I was in the OPC, I was in reformed background. So. Um, you know, these conversations are a little tricky because it depends on who you're talking to, right? I mean, I've had great conversations with Anglicans. I've had great conversations with EO guys, um, Presbyterians, Lutherans, and Evangelicals. And so as I was just kind of thinking about this, you know, what's really been kind of on my heart in this first year after we've entered the church is just really wanting to give my family, especially my extended family, uh, a little bit more context and to my dear friends, you know, that I, I grew up with um, that are primarily evangelical. So I was kind of wanting to kind of start with that. So I'm sure we'll leak into both, but, but I guess the best place to start is that I was raised in a very, uh, in a godly home that, that stressed, you know, the importance of God's word. Um, it ended up being a really great thing because it was really the Bible that I found uh, my way into Catholicism. Um, lots of church, experience in my youth, non-denominational, Calvary chapels, some parachurch organizations, um, student venture. So I, I knew the Bible, I would say, pretty well, uh, pretty early on. Um, so things kind of changed for us in like 2006. And my wife and I had an opportunity to work with Francis Chan in Simi Valley. Um, and he's a, he was a mega church pastor that, that a couple of years after we went up there and ended up leaving his church and becoming a missionary. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but very uh, popular in the um, evangelical world. So we helped a good friend start a church plant out of Simi Valley Cornerstone up in that Ventura area. Uh, and it was a, a really good time for us. Um, the gentleman that was kind of the lead pastor of that endeavor, uh, Steve Solomon, was a good friend of mine. We had been reading a lot of John Piper together. And by proxy, had been introduced to a lot of the Reformers and Puritan writings, you know, the past 500 years, which, you know, you typically uh, you start kind of diving, of dipping your toes into church history, more or less. Um, we would go to Desiring God conferences uh, in Minneapolis. That, that was Piper's conference. We went to Shepherd's conference, which was John MacArthur's church, which was actually a, like about an hour away from where uh, Simi Valley Cornerstone was. So there was a bunch of young men that joined our endeavor. So it was a really good time of working through some deeper theological truths that were generally, you know, tolerated at my previous churches to some degree. But, um, you know, theology, especially theology outside of the bubble of churches that you're raised in as an evangelical is generally seen as suspect and divisive, right? Sure. So if you're a Methodist, you know, you're right and everybody else is dangerous to read. If you're Calvary Chapel, you read Chuck Smith, everyone else is dangerous to read. Uh, if you're Arminian, you don't read Calvin, you know, and so on and so on, all the way into 33,000 denominations. So, but later that year, I made a decision um, to apply to the uh, master Seminary. And um, I did a little over 50 graduate units at Master Seminary, which again is a school that John MacArthur is president of. Um, and, I, and I loved it. I love the people there. I love the professors. Um, but I think over time, I really started to struggle with the principles that they used in interpreting scripture. And um, and that first principle that, that really, I, it, it's funny because there's all these ideas that they have, like, you know, rapture, seven little day creation, those types of things you hear. 
all that comes from this foundational idea of, you know, of hermeneutics, these principles of interpretation. So the first principle really was this idea of if it's possible, it should be literal. So literal and possible. Um, another thing is they never saw the church as the fulfillment to the promises of Israel. So, so Israel is always Israel. The church is always the church. So what happens to get this idea of a rapture is that God in the Old Testament is working specifically with the Jewish people. Then in the New Testament, he takes this parenthetical break of working exclusively with Israel, and he grafts the Jews and the Gentiles together, and that body is called the church, and that's the current age that we're in. And then he'll rapture that body you know, um, out, and then after we're raptured into heaven, then he'll go back to work exclusively with the Jews in the millennial age. Okay. Yep. So that's really where that comes from, right? So, and it comes from really making sure like you never, there's no typology, you know, the, the Jews are not this like, um, their spiritual Israel is, is, is something that's not seen as, as a right interpretation. You know, the church is not spiritual Israel to, to that particular group of people. So the biggest problem with this, dispensational version of you know premillennialism is that it, it just simply doesn't exist in the church fathers like at all um or really before the 19th century for that matter uh, and the hermeneutics that get them to those conclusions you know i really came to believe are are you know patently incorrect um and i think one story from that seminary that really kind of solidified it for me is i was in a preaching class and we read uh, Brian Chappell's um, a Theology of Christ-Centered uh, Met, what, what, no, what was it called? Yeah, I think it was a Theology of Christ-Centered Messages. And it was this redemptive approach. Um, no, Christ-Centered Preaching was the name of the book. It's the name of the book. And in there, there was a section. It was called um, Christ-Centered Messages or the Theology of Christ-Centered Messages. It was like the third part of the book. And we read every chapter, you know, up to that point later in the semester. And it's really this redemptive approach to expository preaching. And we skipped it. Um, because they're so committed to this literal and possible historic grammatical interpretation that they rejected these clear Christological frameworks of huge sections of the Old Testament. Um, and they actually refer to most typology done through church history as allegory. And they meant that in a very negative sense, you know? So, I mean, just for an example, like take the story of Jonah, you know, um, it's not a story about evangelism, right? It's about a man that descends. And, and that word is in the Hebrew. When you read Jonah in the Hebrew, um, that word descends is super important. It says it over and over and over again. He descends to the dock. He descends into the boat. He descends to the lowest part of the boat. You know, he descends to the depths of the sea after he's cast over the rail. Um, and then it's funny because when you read Jonah, like all of a sudden, I remember when I was reading Hebrew, I'm like, wait, did Jonah just die? Like there's this part where it really looks, doesn't always come out in the English, but I think he dies, you know. Yeah. Anyways, three days later, vomits on the, you know, resurrected preaches the gospel to the Gentiles. I mean, who does that sound like? You know, that, that's obviously Christ. And, you know, and just in case, you know, that there's any confusion about that, you know, you see Jesus himself tell the Pharisees flat out, you know, you're going to see, you'll, you'll see no more signs except for one. And that's the sign of Jonah. And he's clearly talking about his resurrection. Right. Um, but what I find even more interesting, um, and this is really, I think, like I talked about, type, typology is really the first bridge in helping evangelicals have these conversations. Um, but there are two times that Jesus specifically gives uh, how to interpret the Old Testament, like explicitly tells us how to interpret the Old Testament. One is in John 5, again, talking to the Pharisees, and um, he says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. Then he says, do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. He's talking to the Pharisees. There is one who accuses you. It's Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believe Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote about me. So, okay, Moses, the Pentateuch, first five books, it says he wrote about Jesus. Well, then even more poignant is in Luke 24 on the stranger road to Emmaus, right? After his resurrection, he's walking with those people that these, he, he shrouds himself. They don't know who he is. And at the end of that, he says, you know, foolish ones, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. 
Was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And then it says, in beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interprets them and all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. And then, you know, that's the, uh, if you've read that, we were talking about that Jesus in the Jewish roots of uh, the Eucharist by Bram Petrie, but, you know, he's, he breaks bread there and, and then they kind of like recognize him and then he vanishes. And then they look at each other and they said, you know, did our hearts not burn within us yeah. when he talked to us on the road, when he opened our hearts to the scriptures? And so I think you see it over and over again that, you know, that the Psalms, you know, the uh, Moses, the prophets, every, all the old, basically that's kind of a short way of saying that the entire Old Testament is talking about me. So, you know, David and Goliath, that Charles Swindoll wrote that book. He's an evangelical author, yeah. How to Overcome Giants in Your Life. You know, and that's that's not the case at all. Like in the Hebrew language, again, you, even Goliath's armor is like got this kind of like uh, snake serpent kind of like quality to it. You know, it's this again, this allusion to this cosmic battle. You know, it's not a self-help book, more or less. So I think if Catholics really want to evangel or engage evangelicals, you know, typology is really the key to that lock to start with, because without proving that first, you know, we can talk about Mary, we can talk about, um, you know, Sola Scriptura, Apostolic Succession, all those things are really important. But, um, and that's, and that's really why I see like things like Brent Petrie, the stuff he's doing where he's, he's uh, helping, you know, draw these parallels um, between um, the Old Testament, the way the Jews thought from, you know, 200 BC to 500 AD, and, and really, you know, what were the new authors actually hearing? Um, I think that work's been really important, but we can yeah. we can get into that a little bit later. Yeah. Um, hey, hey, let me uh, interject. Sure. Is there something, is it your chair or keyboard? There's something that's giving me some feedback, and it's actually increasing in noise. Is it? I don't know what's going on. but Let me check that. <laughs> and yeah, is that better? Me too. When, that I was think what? When you move, maybe that's what's going on. Okay. Anyway. Um, also, so I just started at the Augusta Institute on yeah. Monday, and I don't know if you've seen this, the Great Adventure Bible Timeline. Okay. Tim Gray, the founder of the Augustan Institute, and Jeff Kevin I haven't seen that. And yeah. Jeff Evans put together. And what it does is... And we can get into this even more later, and it's kind of hard to show the whole thing, but mm -hmm. it breaks the Bible into these very distinct categories. And as you identify the 12 distinct categories and the 14 distinct books that fit within those and the supplemental books as well, the 59, mm -hmm. you can start to see the typology that you're talking about in a right. very aerial, with a, an aerial perspective, like you're saying, mm -hmm. you start to see what they call the red thread jesus yeah throughout yeah. all of it but anyway yeah yeah i thought that was really yeah. actually eye-opening for me so yeah and, and if we have time we should talk about like just the covenants throughout scripture too and how that i mean all that ties to him that's, it's just that's pretty true. awesome yeah. stuff yep so but so really i got i guess at that point you know i i made a decision to um change seminaries because i i knew that i was either going to finish you know, with 110 graduate units uh, and be an expert in a hermeneutic that I knew was incorrect sure. um, or I had to transfer. So I left there with half my MDiv done and transferred to Westminster Seminary in California, um, which for the most part was was great. And uh, Westminster taught a historic redemptive hermeneutic quite well and um, had a very robust and much less biased historical theology program, great typology, et cetera, good engagement with the fathers. So it didn't take long for my wife and I and um, my kids at that point to really kind of leave broader evangelicism, for lack of a better term, and join the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Um, and truthfully, the Orthodox, Orthodox Presbyterian Church we joined um, was fantastic. Um, uh, Providence OPC in Temecula and the, the pastor, Jesse Purcell, and I would even say uh, Catholic EO Anglican, you want to really know how to preach Christ in the Old Testament, you should actually Google his messages. He's fantastic. Stuff in Genesis he does is great. Um, but like being under him for 10 years was really like that road to Emmaus experience for me. 
Uh, I just, I literally felt my heart burn after those messages. And I'm like, oh my gosh, there's so much continuity. And it's, it's really the most, it's the best apologetic, you know? I mean, God's words, the continuity through all that is really just an amazing apologetic. So um, great 10 years. And in 2011, when I was, I think it was about the semester I was, I was going to graduate from Westminster when that Catholic argument for the over, it was about a year before, but it really started to hit me pretty heavy. You know, I actually remember going home and praying on the way home from seminary because it was about a 45 minute drive. And, um, and, and there were times I would be crying on the way home because I, I loved my church, you know, and I remember begging God, like, please show me where I'm wrong in this, you know? Um, so in some ways, you know, I was a very reluctant convert, sure. you know, in the beginning. Um, and so the Catholic journey, you know, really ramped up for me in, in probably 2009 and 10, about a, a year and a half before I graduated from Westminster. And it was, it was subtle, you know, at first, but, um, it started with like, you know, if Rome is right about infant baptism, liturgy, apostolic secession, the presence of Christ in the supper, you know, what else could they be right about? And then my senior year, I write this paper <laughs> entitled Mariology and the Doctrine of Adoption, which is a really bad decision for anybody who wants to say Protestant, right? Because I, I get into all I get into all this like great stuff on Mary, and um, I just realized like, uh oh. I think we missed the boat on this one too, you know, and, and in fact, um, there's actually a seminary professor and I won't say his name just to be nice, but from reformed theological seminary in Orlando who actually made a profound admission. He had said, um, if Rome missed the boat on Mary in one direction, the Protestants have certainly made as big of an error, if not more in the other. So I thought that was pretty telling. Um, and he's right. He's right. So, so during the next couple of years, you know, I actually started to talk to one of your professors, Michael Barber, who at the time um, was at John Paul the Great University down the street from Escondido, which is where Westminster West was. Um, I got I chatted with Scott Hahn on the phone and online. I got in contact with him. I started to correspond with Brian Cross from Call to Communion, who I think by far was probably one of the most influential people. That that website was fantastic. And if you are an Anglican, Presbyterian, or Lutheran, um, a more Reformed perspective person, th there's some great articles and discussion on that website. I, I highly recommend it. It's not as active as it used to be, but there's still it's still a great wealth of information. Um, and then after graduation, uh, I got in contact with one of my buddies, um, or a guy actually that I was in class with. His name was Joshua. I'm very bright. Um, guy uh, who became Catholic as well and then went on to get his PhD from Notre Dame and I think he's teaching now at St. Tom Thomas Aquinas in Ojai, California. So he was also very helpful, had several conversations with him, started to meet with priests, etc. Um, one of the very first guys that when Benedict did that Anglo-Catholic, you know, when the, the Anglican priests could come in and be Catholic priests, um, there was a church in Corona, California, and um, Father Andrew Bardis was one actually brought his whole church into Rome, you know, as an Anglican priest, and now he's a Catholic priest. So he was very helpful to us as well. But um, so finally, um, I decide to bring my growing conviction that, you know, Rome might be right uh, to my wife. Um, and, she, you know, there's a lot of change to go from non-denominational just to Orthodox Presbyterian. So, you know, I didn't want to fire hose the poor lady, but, and, and she is the most amazing woman and you met her. She's great. Um, has given me five wonderful children uh, at the time they were eight, six, four, two, and new. So super busy. Um, she held the fort down with me in seminary while I worked nights full time in intensive care unit. So wow. it was a very difficult season for five years. Cause that's how long it took me to get through it. And um, and I had lost so many credits when I transferred from master's, so it, it took just a long time. But but when I told her I, I was heading towards Catholicism, she says, no way. She's like, no way um, at the first. And, and I think if, you know, uh, at the end of the day, she'll tell you um, that she knew it was most likely going to cause a huge family rift. Um, and you know, with the current season of life that we were in, that loss was just too much to bear, you know. Um, so, 
and when I started to like tell her all about my theological discoveries I was making, you know, she's exhausted, barely sleeping. <laughs> Theology energizes me, right? But she just looks at me and she's just like, just wasn't interested in that time of life. Um, yeah. I mean, very faithful, godly, amazing woman, you know. So I had this kind of crisis moment because she's always had always followed me and we, we, we had kind of blazed this trail together. Um, so I had to decide, like, was I going to go on without her? And I know there's like a whole bunch of different views on this. You know, Scott Hahn, you know, definitely went before his wife went. Um, I have a very good friend who did the same. I don't necessarily think there's a right or wrong way to proceed. But for me, God made it very clear to me, um, actually through a priest council, um, to not do it. Not at that time. And my wife had always been like my litmus test, you know, um, my discerning litmus test. Uh, and, you know, I greatly value her insight and intuition to this day. I mean, anytime she has like disagreed with me, I've always, even if it's frustrating, I always go, there's something there. Right. Um, so I had to find solace, um, in actually I found solace in GK Chesterton, who I think waited close to two decades for his wife to convert. And then that. wow. Yeah. It's like 10, 10 to 20 years, something like that. So, so that's the route I chose not knowing it because <laughs> 10 years later, um, in 2019, uh, my wife on our 20th wedding anniversary, we were in uh, Stanley, Idaho. And she goes, hey, I'm nervous to talk to you about something, but I have something I want to tell you. I had no idea what we were going to talk about. And she says, hey, I want to start RCIA this year. And I mean, I was just like, what? You know, shocked, just shocked. We had had conversations over the years, but they usually didn't last very long and usually ended in frustration and, and we just kind of moved forward. But during that 10 years, I had done everything in my power to try to talk myself out of the Catholic argument. Um, there are times that I would be a little successful for a while, but that calling, you know, of Rome kind of always came back and question after question kept getting answered. But man, I tried to be Anglican. I tried to be EO. I tried to be confessional Lutheran, um, you know, anything but Rome because the misconceptions of our, our family and our friends, we knew were going to be extensive and we're going to be a really tough road to bear. Yeah. So when she finally told me that she was ready, you know, I was a bit surprised um, at the size of that weight, you know, that kind of went off my back. You know, I, I, I tried to tell myself it had not, was not a big deal, but my heart rejoiced that day. Like, you know, I can't even put into words. I was so excited for it. So, um, so that August 2019, my wife, my five kids, who were 18, 16, 14, 12, and 9 at that time, started RCIA together. Um, it was not an easy, not an easy process. And I'm, I'm shocked to find that that's very common. It seems like that, especially Protestant convert seminary, especially Protestant converts, really have a hard time in RCIA. And um, I was definitely not the exception. But I think... A lot of it is because Catholics and Protestants really do talk past each other quite a bit. Yeah. Um, and Catholic, Catholics have this tendency to really overstate their case, just like Protestants do, right? So um, just the big one, right? When, um, I mean, because theology needs to be very precise and very nuanced. Um, I mean, you look, you see that in the Trinitarian, you know, formulas. It's very nuanced throughout the centuries. Sometimes it's difficult to understand. So um, when a Catholic says, hey, we're justified by works, just look at James 2. Right, that's the big one you hear all the time. Um, through a Protestant paradigm, it's it's Pelagian, yeah. and um, and and it, it actually sounds Pelagian, and it actually the way they word it a lot of time is Pelagian. You know, um, it's actually in my mind incorrect to say that we're justified by works. Um, uh, or use James two. I'm sorry when you're talking about initial justification. Yes. You know, I would argue, I would argue, as with several Catholic scholars that you're learning, probably that initial justification is by faith alone. I wouldn't even have a problem saying that. Yeah. But justification is uh, we have been justified. We are being justified, you know, and we will be justified. Exactly. So it's, yeah. so it's not that one-time action that, you know, begins this ordo salutis or this order of salvation that Luther was trying to make. So this justification-sanctification relationship um, is tricky because we wouldn't want to say sanctification undergirds justification in the way a Protestant would interpret that statement. Yes. You know, so, 
so anyways, um, again, we can get into more of that in a little bit, but I'm trying to speed through this. Uh, so we hit a really big crisis in November. We moved to Idaho in 2017, but I was still commuting out of state for work. And, um, that, you know, we go through those rights of acceptance, right of election yep. um, during RCIA. So my wife had to go through the first one, which was the right of acceptance by herself. And she, I was on a work stretch in California and she called me at seven in the morning um, and she told me, you know, I, I cannot do this. And, and it, like I said, it had been a rough first couple months. The questions were building, the family implications were immense. Um, and I knew that getting off the phone that day that um, we were done that our journey was over. I actually told her, I said, you know, I understand. I appreciate your perseverance up to this point. I said, well, let's just, just go back to the Presbyterian church we were attending and, and no problem, you know? And so after I hung up, I remember, you know, just telling the Lord um, as I was driving home that morning, you know, Lord, I, I, I think this journey's over. Um, if you want us to keep going, you're going to have to do a miracle because I, I was at the end of any persuasion or any, you know, all this academic, study or whatever didn't matter I, I so it was just really one of those moments that i can say was a complete surrender moment in my life um and i went to sleep because i was working nights and i woke up later that night and called her to check in and she answered the phone and she just could not even talk through the tears i mean she was just bawling um and i'm like what happened um and you know it's it's her story to tell for the most part but there was just God made it abundantly clear to her. She ended up going, took the kids. And it's where they do that sign of the cross, you know, on your eyes, on your ears, on your feet. Yeah. And, and uh, she just said, you know, I just know this is what we're supposed to do with our family. You know, I, I know 100%. And so it was really one of the first of several miracles in that RCIA journey. And, you know, um, and then... You know, three months before our confirmation, I ended up sending a letter out to all our extended family because we had not told them up to this point that we were even in RCAA because we wanted an opportunity for the seven of us and we live out of state from all of them to just think amongst each other, to ask questions and not have a lot of, you know, noise. Sure. The three months, three months before. What month we, was that? Um, what month was that? January. Okay. Say, January, I sent the letter out. Yeah. And I asked, I said, listen, listen you know, Vocalize your concerns, bring questions forward. Many of them did. Um, it was a difficult month. We really dreaded doing this, but we knew that we, we owed, I felt like we owed it to them. I love all of my family to death. And we had several good conversations. Um, others were more difficult and some continue to be difficult, but you know, we made it through that. And so we were like, okay, you know, we made it. So we're getting excited. And then one month before confirmation, COVID hits. And I'm an ICU nurse. You know, so I don't know if you remember, but when we were initially seeing this as healthcare professionals, you know, um, looking at New York and Italy and hearing five to 10% mortality rates, and you know, it, it was very terrifying. I mean, I, I remember like giving, you know, education to like 20 nurses, you know, because uh, I was uh, one of the leads and, you know, telling them this is what we're going to do with PPE and all that stuff. And like literally, Telling them, like, guys, I know that this is scary, you know, but I, I'll, I'm so excited. I'm, I'm ready to charge this hill with you guys. There's not a better group of people. I'm like, there's people, I have tears in their eyes. I mean, it was very scary, um, especially in the beginning. Um, so Lent starts, COVID hits. Um, I drive to Southern California at the end of March to begin a 12 day work stretch in the ICU and to prepare my staff for this pandemic. I spend 12 days at the hospital at the end of March and April, and I work 12 to 14 hour days. Um, I shower in the basement of the hospital and I sleep in my t Toyota Sienna van in the um, parking garage so I don't bring the virus home to any of my family or friends. Mm -hmm. um, and during that stretch, I remember calling the RCIA director and saying, hey, you know, because they shut all the churches down. And I said, you know, is there any way that we could get conditional baptism? Because Kristen and I didn't know the formula, so we needed a conditional baptism. Their kids, we all knew were fine, but have our first reconciliation, um, confirmation for Eucharist. And to make a really long story short, you know, the answer was no. Um, so I reached out to some priests I knew all across the nation, talked to many of them. Um, all of them said, hey, you find a way here and I'll do your initiation rites tomorrow. The problem was, you know, all the flights were shut down. 
you know, I was swamped at work. I couldn't get, you know, a break. Um, so I really just felt like I hit this brick wall. There was no way around it. And um, so finally, there's this one priest um, that I, I got in contact with. And he said, you know, I think you should take your, your um, case to the bishop. And the crazy thing about that was one month before the pandemic hits, the fact that very last, one of the last services the churches were open was that the Boise Cathedral was for that right of candidates and catechumens that um, where we meet the bishop, the right of election. And there's, there's like hundreds of people there because there's all these parishes, right? Hundreds of people there. And so then there's the seven of us, you know, seven, several hundred people. Um, and they start calling our name forward to come shake the hand of the bishop, Josh Schultz. Kristen Schultz, Ethan Schultz, Travis Schultz, Josiah Schultz, Natalie Schultz, Trinity Schultz. We each take our turn, you know, shaking the, the hand of the bishop. And so after the service, we're walking out, and um, I just kind of wave at him, say, hey, thanks. And he, he comes over, he grabs my arm and pulls me to the side, like out of line, you know, and he says, hey, what is your story? You know, and I don't know if it was the seven of us in a row that caught his attention or what. There were other families there. So I told him, you know, I was a seminary grad and kind of just filled him in a little bit and um, didn't think much of it. But, you know, so interestingly enough, um, you know, I, I write him uh, at, later after COVID hits. And I just said, hey, I met you at the right of election. Don't know if you remember me, but, you know, this is this is what's going on. I'm a nurse. You know, I, I really would love to see my kids, that, you know, kind of complete this journey with them? Is there any way that we could, you know, um, have our confirmation? And, and so I don't hear from him because I write him on Holy Thursday, you know, and I knew that, you know, the bishop's super busy <laughs> over Holy Week, but um, I remember that, and, and that Saturday night vigil, oh, and that was like, that was one of the darkest, you know, moments of my life. I, I, I was, I'm watching this online, you know, where we're supposed to be brought in. We were all excited about it. And, and it was just, that was, it was one of the hardest things. I, I, I've never had like my spirit attacked that much. I couldn't even finish it. I couldn't watch the whole thing. I got up and had to leave. Um, so anyways, a couple of days later, Tuesday, my phone rings. I pick it up. The person on the line is, hi, this is Bishop Peter Christensen. Um, he said, hey, listen, I read your email. I remember meeting you at the, the right of election. Um, so uh, tell me what's going on. And so I tell him my situation. And he says, um, listen, you know, your, your story, your letter really moved me. When do you go back to work next? And I said, well, I go back Thursday to go back to work and I see you. He says, okay, can you and your entire family come to the cathedral tomorrow? So this is Wednesday. And I'll personally do all your initiation sacraments, hear your first confession, do your confirmation, first Eucharist, whole thing. Um, even crazier, my uh, good friend uh, and actually my sponsor, who's a deacon at a Catholic church in California, John Gabriel, him and his wife drive up all night, Tuesday night from Southern California, 14 hours straight to be with us for that and don't sleep for like 30 hours. And so we go to the cathedral, we have this beautiful, you know, only our sponsors can be there because it's right in the middle of COVID. And um, it was literally the most amazing day, you know, of my life. And the greatest thing about it was that it was, my kids were there, my wife was there. They were super excited about it. It, it was so impactful to them and, and to us as a family. So I don't know, that's kind of long-winded, I know, but that that's really kind of the skeleton version of, of kind of, I guess, our last, like, 20 years together so that's incredible yeah. man thank you for sharing that so you said let me understand this from 2009 to 2019 that whole time you were at the presbyterian church yeah um uh 2007 2008 or yeah probably 2008 we were there and yeah so probably 10 or 11 years we were at the presbyterian church and you initially said orthodox presbyterian what separates Orthodox Presbyterian from yeah so modern yeah so in you know when in the 40s when there was the big split between fundamentalism and liberalism you know J. Gresham Machen thing that the PCUSA or the Presbyterian Church of America or I'm sorry uh, Presbyterian Church USA that's kind of the original Presbyterian Church which has become you know very 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 liberal um, and so in the 40s, there was basically a northern split, um, 
conservative split, which is the OPC, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, and the Southern split was the PCA. Um, PCA pastors are like R.C. Sproul, Tim Keller, all those guys. Okay. So, um, and but they're like the OPC and the PCA and the URC. They're like sister denominations. They get along really well. So, it's just um, the conservative branch of Presbyterianism. I guess. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, you were what you were describing. So August twenty nineteen. That's when I reverted. My wife essentially started RCIA that same month kids were baptized mm -hmm. so I'm kind of following your track my wife was received into the church just before mm -hmm. COVID, actually nice um, and you mentioned family trying to understand it yeah if you can you know what are some of the main questions that came back at you and your family because obviously I feel whether you're a revert or a convert whether you like to or not, you are propelled into apologetics and mm -hmm. you, to you very are. quickly cover as much ground as possible, yeah. and answer as many questions as possible. Obviously, that's yeah. not the whole picture like I talked about uh, with our last guest, but you know, there's also that element of witnessing to them. But when you write a letter, it's not, it, you're not there in person. So I was just curious yeah. if you could talk about some of those questions a little bit. Well, I mean, they've been they've been so across, you know, all over the place in some sense. Um, I, for some people, um, you know, uh, it, it, there's the, there's the basic common things, you know, the idolatry with Mary, you know, the the statues. Um, that's the, for other people, it's justification. Sure. Um, yeah. For other people, for other people in our family, it's you know, like you're adding to the Bible, you know, the sola scriptura stuff, um, that kind of thing, and um, so a lot of that. Um, and then in addition to that, you know, I'm having conversations with a lot of my old seminary buddies and those are all, those are totally different conversations. Um, so I think, um, one of the things I remember writing to my family and, um, also to the elders of the church of the Presbyterian church, I wrote them a letter. Um, in fact, actually, I think I like, there was a Calvin quote, that um yeah here it is it says uh whenever we see the word of god rightly preached and heard and the sacraments administered according to christ's institution there is a church right so um that's that's kind of the whole approach of protestantism is that there's this in my mind a very subjective word of god rightly preached sacraments rightly administered yeah um so the central marks for him are that. Um, and, but then people don't quote the next part of that quote. And he says, even if the church otherwise swarms with faults. Okay. So he's, so that's very interesting. So then I, I, what I did was, is I juxtaposed um, Ignatius of Antioch. So second century, one of his quotes with Calvin's quote to kind of like bring my point home to them. You know, it was, you know, let us be careful then not to set ourselves in opposition to the bishop. Because if you read Ignatius and you read Clement, Clement yeah. Uh, so let us not then set ourselves up in opposition to the bishop in order that we may be subject to God. And then I added Calvin's quote, even if he otherwise swarms with fault. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, so again, I think what's important for them is I'm like, guys, I don't think that Rome is not swarming with faults. In fact, if it really is the Christ, the church that Christ established, I would imagine, you know, that Satan is working overtime. And so there have been terrible popes and there have been terrible bishops and terrible priests, but guess what? There are terrible Protestant preachers. There are terrible, you know, evangelical preachers. And the bottom line for me is that evangelicalism and Protestantism you know, they, they did a lot to kind of wake, you know, when, when they split, Rome had to, they had some things they had to get together and it helped. I mean, I would say yeah, it did help Rome in a sense. Um, but Protestantism and the Reformation and splitting has, in my mind, has introduced so much more error to the church. So much more error. I mean, we have like rampant Gnosticism now, you know, in the church. We have churches that don't even barely practice baptism and the Lord's Supper. And really, it, it just all goes back to this you know, well, you have faith and it's very subjective. Well, what's the quality of your faith? Well, it's faith in what Christ did, not when you did. Okay, so how do you know that's applied to you? Sure. 
Yep. I mean, yes, it is Christ. We know it's Christ. So they always want to say, well, it's about Christ, not about the quality of your faith. I agree with that. And if you're a full-blown you know, a universalist, then you're consistent and you have nothing to worry about. But most of them are not, right? Mm. So, um, you know, that was, I guess, like, yeah, that for me, I, I guess, is, is what I started to really try to help them see is that um, we need to be in Rome continually trying to fight, um, you know, for truth and, and uh, fight. But not that I, not to a point where I would say, you know, Rome has made any mistakes in the councils or where it's spoken definitively ex cathedra. And, and, and that's the other question, too, is taking them to Scripture over and over again. Like, who gets to make these decisions? Look at Acts 15. How did they make a decision in Acts 15? You know, do, 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 the, um, do the new converts or the Christians, they have to be circumcised first and become Jews first. And they have the you know, Council of Jerusalem. They have, you know, Peter, James, all, all the disciples and the elders all come. They have this big discussion. And Peter says, okay, you know, this is what we're going to do. James says, sounds good to me. Um, then they send binding letters out to all the church, and that is binding dogma, you yeah. know, and that's that's happened 21 times, you know, in church history. So that's really the point is, as I really be drawn to that subjectivity and um, and then the other things, you know, it's just one question at a time and, and trying to show them through scripture. Um, if it's Mary, if it's, you know, the, the misconception that Catholics add to the Bible, um, you know. Those 66 books as a canon, they don't even exist before Luther, you know, and Luther wanted to take tons more books out. You know? So I don't know. It's it's really a lot of historical revision. Yeah, and no. I think it just takes time to answer question after question. No, I agree. Um, one thing I'll say is obviously all the division, and I wrote about this towards the end of my book, and I'm going to be writing another book about the Reformation with all those divisions, I will say, you, you mentioned this, and I did some research into it, the 33,000 denomination claim. Mm. I think it's technically, when they really studied it, it was mm. less than 2,000. But mm -hmm. the point remains that if you were to call out every different statement of faith, that's where yeah. you see the core disagreements. And then you yeah. say, well, are you in communion with these other brothers and sisters? And right. people will arbitrarily say yes or no. And then you'll say, right. based on what tenets? Right. And they might say, I mean, everyone's going to be different. And then they realize, sure. oh man, I'm making a declaration about yeah. what Christ told the church. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. I wanted to, to add that because it's still, even if it's an inflated number, I, I think it is important to get down mm. to a real number but if you were to stand there and count every mm. every type of statement of faith it would be heartbreaking is really what it is because yeah. this human history is just people dividing and it's I, and i think you know yeah I, I think if you're talking about evangelical churches too in general um you know my experience is that like you said the vast majority like i think about where i was from temecula california then even the non-denominational churches have always had like big problems with the other non-denominational churches. You know, I mean, there was never that like unity. I, I, there was rare that churches really had kind of common heart. Church splits were like so common. And so I do think that there was, a, you know, very kind of rampant division in some sense, um, even though it may not be denominations or whatever, but I think that's kind of where they, they see that. And there just is not a lot of unity in general. Um, but again, you know, it is, it's all subjective. Uh, and so, um, I, you know, regardless, I, I just feel like Rome um, and the East, even though they're divided, you know, they're still, they, they haven't become divided uh, out of apostolic secession. So for instance, like, if you look at like um, the Northern Southern Israel split, in the Old Testament, right? They're still connected through Levitical priesthood, through through these, in a sense, like these like secession things, you know, the Davidic covenant, Levitical covenant, and those types of things. So they're still kind of valid. And then, but there's come a point where, you know, outside of um, 
you know, when you break out of apostolic secession and then you follow, you know, kind of Calvin's idea where the word of God is rightly taught, the sacraments rightly administered, that is just um, Pandora's box. Yeah. Because there is no way to arbitrate, you know, to have any type of arbitration. There's no, even in, in Rome, you know, there are very liberal people. I mean, just turn on, you know, um, re read the debates about Vatican II. Right. I mean, you see yeah. Benedict, you know, Henri de Lubac, all those guys, you know, they write Vatican II. And then you have this very left interpretation of Vatican II. And then they kind of say, no, that's not what we meant. And then you have this very radical traditionalist sect that's saying, you know, Vatican II should be thrown out. It's not dogmatic. It's not this and that. Um, it's a lot of division. But but we all come to the table together. Fighting is part of it. You know, but we come to the table together and there is a unity and it's and the division is of a very different nature in Rome yeah. than it is in Protestantism. Yeah. And uh, back to what I was saying earlier about that timeline chart and what you said about covenants. They are following this thread throughout the Bible, you know, starting with one holy couple and then one holy family, Noah, one holy tribe, one mm -hmm. holy nation. Right. One holy kingdom, one yep. holy Catholic and apostolic church. So you see worldwide kingdom, right? Everything exactly. Mm -hmm. When you come back to one, yeah. yes, as we see throughout the Bible, there will be um, disagreements. Let's say, mm -hmm. but you're absolutely right. It all should flow up to one, and right. and that's what we're called to do. If we notice that we are sowing division that's something we really have to be open to examining yeah. in our conscience i believe yeah. and ultimately try so hard within the church to really bridge unity and it starts with individual doing what they must do to be a witness to those other people and just live yeah. like christ in charity anyway that's yeah i mean and, and then the big verse that totally testifies what you're saying you know out of john 17 and Jesus says, you know, Father, may they be one as you and I are one so that the world may know that you sent me. And, you know, we have got to, and that, and that was really what I, I, I had said to the elders of the church. Um, you know, I, I had said, like, you know, my deepest conviction is that we have to lay down the cause of Protestantism as a movement to advance the healing of our divided church, mainly because, you know, unlike the EO and Roman Catholic division, its nature violates those markers of apostolic secession. You know, I mean, Luther yeah. does continue this laying out of hands, but he has no historical precedence for doing so as a mere priest before that, right? It's only bishops that had holy orders. So, you know, I, I told him, like, I I wanted to to stand with him. I wanted to stay with them. I want that because I loved the guys I was with at the church and I still do there. And that's, I, I want to make that point too, you know, uh, Traditional Protestants, specifically, a lot of Presbyterians, Lutherans, Anglicans, um, kind of the Anglicans would take uh, offense at being called Protestants, but yeah. um, I see them as allies. And as I've gotten into academia, you know, like the, we, there is, it's, it's not kind of this fundamentalist throwing stones at each other. There really is this desire to want to understand truth and interact with each other. And you know, they're my, they're my some of my closest friends, you know, um, I, I would, so I, I think that there's a lot of guys that are building a kingdom, even though they're not necessarily Roman Catholic or whatever, we're all trying to figure this out. Um, but in a sense, uh, you know, I just, I really want to call that out because I mean, I gleaned so much from Protestant scholarship and I think it's very reductionistic to, you know, say, Oh, you know, don't read that. But anyways. I understand. Yeah. Well, Josh, I think we got to call it there. I uh, thank you so much for that story. And, you know, I appreciate how honest you were about the journey. And I know how difficult these things are. People mm -hmm. still, until they experience it, they don't know how difficult that paradigm shift is, but I appreciate it. And we'll, uh, we'll, we'll hopefully talk soon. Um, anyway. Alrighty. I invite you guys all to subscribe to my channel. I'm going to have two more episodes coming up next week. And until then, take care and God bless.